Hello, and welcome to The Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. Okay, so um, everything's rolling on my end. Um, I don't even think we need to do a formal intro. I think we're just already here. We are We are here. We're welcoming we everyone to The Canadian Story. We're... Uh, we're going to do a little cousin chat today. As you all know, David's my cousin, and we're joined uh, again by our other cousin, other cousin, Daniel. So, Daniel, welcome to the show. It's good to see you, my friend. Appreciate it. You're uh, you're looking all slicked up, man. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> oh, <I laughs> Just looking fantastic. You know, it's always nice to you know get a couple <laughs> comments. You know. Is there a lady <laughs> in your life? Fans, like You look like fans. you cleaned <laughs> up. <laughs> Hey, I, I came back from running a couple sales, you know what I mean? So you got to look presentable, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Dan, you Dan, Dan you know? <laughs> share with us your thoughts on the state of the world. Like, what do you, <laughs> you, you you've fled the country this year. You've, <laughs> you've well, changed, I changed your residence. I, n- I never flee, but I did chart a new path. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't retreat. I just ran into a new battle. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yes. no, it's, it's been fantastic, honestly. I mean, um, yeah, it's uh, been, definitely been an adjustment. I moved down to Texas at the start of last year, uh, this, the start of this year. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been pretty fantastic, I have to say. It's definitely an adjustment, quite different than Canada, of course, in South, in, in South Texas. But uh, yeah, no, it's great. I mean, um, culturally, there's a lot of differences that it's like, wow, you don't even really, like, uh, uh, take into consideration that, like, people, you know, speak English more or less, but it's, like, just little things, you know what I mean, that just make it so different and, you know, make it a bit of an adjustment where it's, like, oh, man, for a little while you feel like a fish out of water, and it's, like, oh, they're just human beings with, like, little different idiosyncrasies and stuff like that, you know, but, yeah. Okay, so, uh, but yeah. the, the first and obviously most important question is, are you open carrying yet? Yeah, uh, I'm not yet. I'm I'm ashamed to say I uh, I intend to get a gun in the start of the New York New Year, and um, yeah, that's pretty high on the priority list. So man, if I'm if if I moved to Texas, I would be open carrying the millisecond I was legally allowed to do so. <laughs> Oh, people do it everywhere. You know, you just like walk into Walmart, and you know, there's like you know multiple people strapped up. Do you feel unsafe? Uh, quite the contrary. I feel much more safe than, uh, I ever did. Uh, you know, let's say just sort of like, you know, going like downtown Hamilton and that kind of thing. I mean, well, the issue of safety is kind of, it's an interesting question, I guess, because I feel like there's, there's definitely a feeling where stuff could like pop off at any moment. So I think actually given that people actually conduct themselves with a lot more respect, mm-hmm. which I found very interesting. Cause you know, in, uh, in Canada, we have the reputation for being like, Oh, so nice, you know, polite people, you know what I mean? Not, not completely untrue, but, um, you know, behind a lot of interactions down here, there's like a, uh, there, there's like the, the minor like threat of violence. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you don't know, like you, you better watch your tone because you don't know who could be, you know, doing what, you know? So uh, you're, in, you're incentivized to be respectful, which I think is beautiful. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Like people are a lot more, I, I would honestly say people are more like genuinely like kind down here, which I didn't expect. Like I thought everybody would be like really like, rough like me first you know and uh it's really just not the case but no it's been fantastic in that can you imagine if twitter was real life and that movie was set in texas (laughs) what what movie a real life twitter Twitter movie movie. like if if twitter was real life and people said that stuff in real life but it was set in texas and everyone was trapped (laughs) oh oh, yeah no no, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) you would be getting off left right center it's an interesting fact that like apparently only one in four Canadians is on Twitter. So like most, most even Canadians, and I imagine most Americans aren't even on Twitter. And yet for a certain group of people, it's such a, a huge part of their, I don't know, information ecosystem. 
Right. And you look at like, especially before Elon took over, how skewed things were. I mean, the, the whole enterprise was being run by communists, basically. Um, and uh, therefore, a lot of the members that are the, you know, people who signed up for Twitter had accounts skewed left as well you know and uh that's that's where you get like i mean the, the 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 whole silent majority thing with trump was sort of true in the 2016 election in particular <laughs> um and it's just in, it, interesting like you said <clears throat> how like echo chambers get started you know and you look at like aoc's tweets and like everyone gets like 300,000 likes and it's like well how much influence does she have really not really all that much in the democratic party and you right know, def- right and, and definitely like the average american doesn't care at all what she has to say you know um <laughs> including democrats yeah but I, th- I think the the twitter takeover is actually one of the most interesting stories of 2022 to be honest like i think um that's it's already significantly shifted the landscape in, in terms of acceptable discourse. And I think shining light on like how corrupt, uh, you know, the, the, um, the FBI is even, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, uh, how, how much they were trying to sweep under the rug. Uh, of course, like the Hunter Biden suppression story, um, you know, uh, all that stuff. It's like really astounding how, um, they just like, they, 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 they don't care about you. So you know? I, I, I want to just, I, I want to, <clears throat> because we're talking about it and I think it's important and correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be, but, um, according to the Twitter files, which are basically, um, evidence that's being published about what was going on behind the scenes over the last couple of years on Twitter, the FBI was paying Twitter to crush the story about the Hunter Biden laptop, that was in fact true. We have that correct, right? For the for the people who who haven't been following the story, uh, it's correct that the FBI paid Twitter and that the Hunter Biden story was <laughs> quashed. There's not necessarily a, a direct, a direct connection in quid yeah. pro quo there, but um, yeah, the FBI was paying Twitter and then and they suppressed. Basically, any news story the Biden campaign wanted. So why don't we take a swing, Daniel, as as to why that might be a problem? Let's go down that path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, if um, if we're under the illusion, and this is, you know, America, one of the quote unquote freest nations on earth. And you can only imagine how much, you know, influence and manipulation comes from like you know the world economic forum in terms of like canadian elections that you know people are just like you look at like canadian news media and i mean to be fair i mean american uh media isn't a lot better but um it's like like the the canadian media is essentially you know run by communists too you know and uh but yeah i mean it's just uh it's a it's a problem when people don't have access to free speech of course and um you know you look at uh just where like public opinion lies on things like nobody knew that um let's let's take the abortion issue for example that like the the numbers were so like evenly skewed between people who supported it versus, versus were against it if you if if um um the decision from the supreme court hadn't come down we would probably, you know, never, never even realized how many people (laughs) actually supported like a pro-life agenda, you know? And, um, it's just astounding to think like everybody who is on the right can kind of feel it over time that, uh, like, well, you know, especially once COVID hit, I think everything kind of came to the the surface or was just imminently obvious that, um, they were like suppressing stories that didn't fit their agenda. And you, you see how it's spun out of control. I mean, that's the problem. You know, we just, we, we, we can't help hand over um, the power of our voices to the oligarchs, you know, because uh, they only have their interest in, in mind. Well, and I think it's interesting what you said there, Dan, and I'd like your thoughts on this too, Zach, but when, when we're talking about narratives and what's being built, if you're not allowed to speak and question things anymore, if if truth is literally being suppressed for political gain, 
then you're not in a democracy anymore. You're in something else. And when we see that the intelligence agency of the greatest power in the world, like I think people still believe that, even if China is getting close and there's there's contenders. If the if the intelligence agency of that government is actively interfering in the election for a specific party, we've lost the plot. We're, we're not we're not in a we're not in a democracy anymore. We're in some kind of weird political war, like for 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 all the marbles for for everything. And and I'd be interested in, in your guys' thoughts on this. But like when all this started, Dan and I were living together for a portion of it. And we were like, why are they doing this? And we couldn't, we couldn't figure out what the agenda was. And it, and it took a long time. And, and Zach and I have interviewed a lot of people talking about this. But what do you guys, now that we've been through almost three years of this, like we're, we're heading into, into year three, what do you guys think, who's, who's won from this? Who's lost from this? And, and where does the state of the board? We, we always used to play board games, Risk and all these things. Let's let's talk about the board. Dan? Uh, well, the first the first winner that comes to mind is Pfizer <laughs> and, <laughs> and all of their investors. <laughs> so that's that's number one. Um, I mean, the, the Democratic Party for for I think a short amount of time has uh, done pretty well off of this because uh, I think um, you know you just look at like again on the media, but like. like how they were able to like whip people up the whole world into this frenzy, you know, and, um, and people didn't have any choice on whether or not they participated, you know, like um, if you were, you know, if you were screaming from the high heavens for COVID mandates and vaccine mandates and masks and all this, you, you were completely free to go as far down that road as you wanted to go. Um, If you made the choice that you wanted to, you know, breathe fresh air and not get um, jabbed with an experimental vaccine. You didn't have that freedom in a lot of parts of the world, you know? And, um, you know, I think we've seen over the past couple of years, an attempt to erode freedoms of the general public, because frankly, the people who like are like uh, comprise, you know, the ruling class, they don't, they they don't like you. (laughs) They they don't have faith that, you know what's best for yourself and that you can make your own decisions. They need to feel like, um, you know, they, 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 they have control, you know? And uh, I think that, that's one of the primary things that we've seen. I mean, as far as like, who's winning, you also look at um, <laughs> the Democrats, as far as like this whole FTX story and stuff like that. And like the, the crypto, um, um, fallout and stuff like that and uh the fact that he donated like 40 million dollars to the democratic campaigns in the in the midterms and then oh oh, all of a sudden they go belly up and the money can't be found it's like there is just corruption afoot left right and center and um you know it's a a lot of this stuff was happening in the darkness for quite some time and it's just now coming to light but i mean i think I think the past couple of years have been a great time for uh, people of that ilk and people who are like, you know, running Ponzi schemes with taxpayer money, essentially. But I'm hopeful that the chickens will come home to roost pretty soon. But those would be a couple of my winners and then the the losers, uh, you know, for the past little bit, I think uh, the people who believe in freedom have taken the biggest L, but I think that's about to change. Why do you think that's about to change? I just feel like the tides are shifting too much where like people realize that like the vaccine stuff was like more or less a fraud. And, you know, there was, it was more of like public interest pressures that fueled the whole thing as well as, um, you know, they had like been like, Governments have been duped essentially into um, believing the studies that Pfizer had done on its own product, by the way. Um, and they bought so much of this stuff that they had to, you know, find people who would take it or else they'd be left with a bunch of expiring product. 
And so I think people are, have started to see through that, that it's not very effective, that there is huge questions about the, uh, the, about the safety of it. And so I think, you know, fool me, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. I think there's a growing number of people in that boat. And, you know, I'm hopeful that the tides will continue to shift more and more, at least towards, you know, maybe maybe you're like a, the biggest vaccine fanatic in the world, but at least having the decency to like not force it on other people. I think there are more people waking up to that <laughs> idea. Yeah, I would think so, too. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting? So let's I hate handing out benefit of the doubts, especially to the government. Um, but if we were to hand them one. Um, isn't it an interesting piece of, of, I guess we'll call it human psychology because governments are, are run by humans that in the midst of what was obviously an intense and, um, scary and, and weird time, there was not enough wherewithal within the leadership of frankly, most countries around the globe to go, hold on the only data that we have on this entirely new technology that we're just supposed to put into every one of our citizens comes from the company that made it. No one raised that red flag. That is, it can only, unless, unless it was more malicious and planned intentionally, the only thing that I can think about that being is fear. That's the only thing. And isn't it interesting to watch entire nations react in fear? Yeah. It, it was very interesting. And I think you're absolutely right about the the world leaders and stuff like that. I don't think they cared at all about how effective it truly was. All they cared about was that there was a study that was published that said it was. And so that was their like, you know, you know, look, look at me moment of like, look at, look at what we're delivering for you guys. We, we're, we're getting you guys the vaccine. It's sort of like a, it's a lifeline for politicians. I think all of this stuff, I, I can attribute certain levels of corruption and stuff like that. I think you're right, though. Overall, it was largely driven by fear. And it was a pretty uh, like well-orchestrated campaign of fear-mongering, essentially. You know, I, uh, I remember early on, I went to see a, a movie in the theaters, and there was this like commercial before it started. That was like this guy just like basically dying alone in a hotel room. And he's like, <laughs> like gasping for air, just this big, like theatrical production or whatever. And it was like, um, like stop the spread of COVID or whatever. And like, I, I know that people have, you know, it, it, it's it, for, for some people, it can be a, a serious illness and, and stuff like that. Um, but just, uh, it was so obvious that like the the fear mongering was just ramped up to such a huge degree. Uh, and I think for politicians as well, it was largely driven by fear as well. It's like, you know, they would rather do too much than too little because if they did too much, then it's like, well, you shouldn't have done so much. But it's like, if they do too little, it's like, well, you didn't do anything and my grandma died. So like now her blood is on your hands, you know? And, uh, yeah, I think that was like what really drove the entire <laughs> situation. What are your thoughts, David, um, coming from a background in politics on on this idea that fear guided nations? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think when we ultimately do the analysis of what happened. I, I actually, maybe I'm a little bit more conspiratorial than Dan, which I would not necessarily have Whoa. thought, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I honestly, like, it, it seems to me that this is more of a test. Perhaps it's like, how far can we push people? What can we push people to do? Because, we're hearing all this talk of like digital currencies and stuff. And everyone's like, oh, you, everyone already has a digital currency. It's like, no, they don't because the government can't shut off my money. It could shut off my access to my bank account, perhaps like it, like it happened during the emergencies act. But like, if it's digital currency, they can just say you can't spend it anymore. Right. And but they, can to be moving. they can confiscate money. They can confiscate money, but, but like they can't click a button and now you can't go to the store and buy things. 
right? Like well, they kind of did. No, they, they kind of did, but <laughs> but they're they're trying to make it easier to do that. Is I guess what I'm saying. And it, and then and then this bill that we're watching go through the house right now. That's that. No word of a lie. Facebook dislikes this bill so much they're literally going to shut down all Canadian news. Cannot be shared on Facebook anymore. Anything what? that is a Canadian news source cannot be shared on Facebook anymore because this Canadian law, no word of a lie, it literally says that Facebook has to pay the news providers for every time it's like shared or, or clicked on. It's, it's wild, right? But the real reason that, that they make it sound like, oh, it's just we want to make greedy Facebook pay, A, it's to force the big corporation Facebook to give money to our dying newspapers. Mm -hmm. But B, and worse, it's going to shut down all of the alternative media's way of getting their message out. So we're talking things like True North, The Western Standard, Rebel, like Epoch Times. They can't, they they get a lot of their traffic from Facebook because whether we like it or not, there's still where almost everybody is. Like younger people, maybe they're more on Twitter, maybe they're more on Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, but... The vast majority of people are actually not young in North America. They're older and almost all of them are on Facebook. Like Facebook is something like 10 to one more users than Twitter has, or even more than that. So when I'm seeing these things happen, I'm like, as much as I agree that it's fear, I think they're using, and I, I totally agree it's fear. And it's, and it's like you said, Dan, it's orchestrated fear. But what really terrifies me is that fear seems to be being used for a longer term plan. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. What I'm confused about is why can't our house of commons look at this bill and go, that's a bad idea. Like it makes like, it makes people like me go, am I the one who's nuts? Like, am I stupid? Like, I don't like how, how does this float through the house where decisions are made for our country and the people who are supposed to be reasonable and elected by the people to represent the people stare at it and go, Hmm, it might be a good idea. Like, how does that happen? How do we, how did we get here? I don't understand that because I must just be like still running on residual like faith in the system. But like these people are supposed to be better than that. Are they not? Well, do you think Trudeau's ever run away from a bad idea? (laughs) Well, yeah, no, (laughs) I don't. (laughs) Well, particularly has he ever run away from a bad idea that gets him votes? Right. Because right. if you think about it, that's the scary part. That's the scariest part to me is like I had problems with Trudeau, you know, back, you know, forever. You know, since, since he said that he was going to grow the economy from the heart outwards and that <laughs> it was, it was, his economic plan was sunny ways. You know, it was around that time that I was able to discern <laughs> that this man wasn't the <laughs> going to have Canada's best interest at heart. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was in that moment that Dan realized that things were not as they seemed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you're right. Because like, the, I mean, like Trudeau can be as much of a numbskull as he wants to be, but it's the fact that pe- so many people, like people, voted for him all those times. And to be fair, if you look at the three elections, so like Harper, people were just sick of him. He'd been there for nine years, you know governed with a fairly heavy hand. Uh, Canada's a liberal country to begin with. I kind of get it, right? Um, and then you look at Sheer, um, just a garbage candidate who won the popular vote. Um, and then O'Toole, an equally garbage candidate who also won the popular vote. So to be fair, Canada isn't beyond hope, but it is frightening to me, frankly, that like, I mean, I, I get why people necessarily didn't love Sheer or O'Toole, but like to see what, I guess, and the thing is people weren't look, really looking at what Trudeau was doing really for the most part. Um, yeah, like, like, are, are most people paying attention? No, the answer is no. You know, you, you have a chance in an election to like get people to really pick up on like, you know, two or three sound bites, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that's about all you can hope for. And that's what Trump was a genius at, frankly, 
was that like, you know, he could drive a message home, you know, like it or hate it, you know, and, you know, a, a lot of it is, you know, fabrications of the truth. But uh, what was it like? Not, not that he's a role model, but I, I believe Hitler <laughs> was the one who said, uh, tell a lie long enough and loud enough and people will believe it. I know. And, and it seems like a lot of a lot of people are are really buying into that quote, like and just like some of the lies that are being told, like it's, it's yeah. We never said that it stopped transmission. Like, <laughs> that is something that people believe now. <clears throat> yeah, people believe that. Yeah. They believe. I, I was I was just having a, an interaction with a service employee. I won't uh, specify who or where, but you know, we were chatting, and they literally said to me, "Oh yeah, but I don't think it was ever supposed to stop transmission." <laughs> I'm like, then why were we taking it? Right. Do you well, think- I, like? Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Dan. I was just saying, like, yeah, because, um, you know, that was the whole point of a, of a mandate. You know, it's like you're free to take and inject whatever you want into your body, you know, but um, there I'm not a historian, but there's been times where vaccine mandates were implemented in the past. Um you know, the, the U S military had one for smallpox, I believe. Um, but like, you know, there was never a thing where like the, like the average citizen was required to have one to enter a restaurant. That's never happened before in Canadian history or world history, world history, but particularly Canada. Yeah. You know, and, um, and, and, and people were just like, People were terrified of COVID. I remember um, reading this uh, article in the Toronto Star, and it was this 22-year-old server, and she was talking about how she was working on the front lines and was risking her life every day by being, like, forced to serve tables and whatever. And people genuinely thought that, that you could be, like, in your 20s and just be, like, on the brink of death while you're completely healthy and you're risking it all to, you know, to wait tables or, or whatever, whatever it is, you know? And I think that, to be honest, I think that was one of the things that was so appealing to people about it all was that, you know, we, we live in a time of like victim culture. Right. And it was the ultimate opportunity to be a victim, you know, like anything that you had to do that might've, put you in contact with COVID, you know, was suddenly caused for your victim status, you know? And I don't know, it was just like really appealing to people. I know like there was so many like um, times where, you know, people would want to ask you the questions and stuff like that entering into uh, uh, their store or whatever. And they really enjoyed it. There was like, I, I noticed this in people where like, they like they, like they'd be smiling while they'd be like asking these questions. It wasn't like a polite, friendly smile kind of way. It was like, I am important, you know. I I matter because I'm here to like ask these questions. And um, I don't know. I think that was such a drug for people, like you know, because there's there's people who haven't tasted an ounce of power or wealth in their lives that are like, oh, suddenly like I I'm I'm an important figure in this chain of you know making sure things. Like um, are going according to plan, and, and you better follow the rules that we have because you know I'm I'm watching you, right? And yeah, there was just so much of that, and yeah, I, I it's uh, it's been crazy to watch, frankly. Yeah, it gave people a taste of um, a taste of purpose that they wouldn't have necessarily had previously, and that was very. Yeah. I think that was intentional and I think that was very, very insidious and unbelievably cunning and smart because when you, when you, um, when you give a demographic of people power and purpose who aren't used to having it, it is, I I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have ever picked this out before, but hindsight's 2020, it becomes very easy to weaponize those people against whoever you want because now they're in it and now they're on the front lines and now they're, you know, they're, they're going to fight. Right. And like, 
you like you have to put where credit you have to put credit where credit is due. This was so well done. Unbelievably it was. well done yeah. and executed mm-hmm. in ways that I didn't think I would ever see. Like I never even thought about it before the pandemic. So my next question is, do you think what we saw, like all of this insidious planning and the the psychological programming, do you think that was a new thing in 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 concern to the pandemic? Or have we been gaslit and manipulated psychologically for longer than than what we would feel comfortable admitting? I think absolutely we have. I mean, if you look at like the course of our lifetimes from like around 1990 to present, um, there hasn't been a moment up until I would say this past year where the tide of discourse has shifted to the right. Like it's always been a slope to the left. Like you look at like um, Obama back in 2008 was against gay marriage. And, uh, you know, you can say, oh, he was just against against that publicly um, to, to garner votes. But I mean, what does that tell you about where the majority of the American population was at, you know? And uh, it's, it's, it's continuously slid that way um, the whole time. And like, let's not get it twisted. Like the whole COVID thing was like a left wing operation. You know, Um, there was right wing people that like took it seriously and were concerned for sure. But without like died in the wool, like left wing politics, like, well, it's, it's funny to, call it left-wing politics because you look at back in like the 60s and 70s and left-wing politics was like anti-establishment you know anti-vietnam war you know love and peace and like you know fuck the man and um the fact that they've become champions of the establishment tells you everything you need to know about where the power balance lies at the moment you know and yeah i mean like it's it's slid to the left our whole life and for, you know, to some, to some degree, I mean, I think, you know, the, the marriage issue, issue is uh, issue is another thing, but certainly, you know, at times, even in our lives, there's been, you know, massive stig- stigma around homosexuality and that kind of thing. And um, even, even I'll grant like, you know, some racial imbalances, even certain gender imbalances to a degree, I think, you know, the, 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 the two genders are not the same. Um, and so there's always going to be imbalance, but, uh, you know, uh, it, um, uh, you know, th- certainly I think there were certain valid, um, grievances that, uh, should have been addressed. Certainly. I mean, I think for example, like me too, went a little bit out of control in terms of how it was like just a witch hunt for anybody who'd ever like touched a woman that she wasn't like 110%, you know, down for whatever um but at the same time there was a lot of genuinely like awful dudes who were like preying on women that needed to be called out you know so there was like uh, bits of that factored in but you know overall like i think at the moment the story of 2022 to me really is that like the right wing for the first time in our lives like clawed back you know and like gain ground and it was actually among certain circles it's like it's okay to say these things you know Mm -hmm. where you know um a few years ago even among right-wing people they wanted to be like politically correct and like not rock the boat you know what i mean it's like oh yes you know we want to make allowance for that too and you know with love to everybody at a certain point you have to put your foot down and say no these are my principles You know, this is where I draw the line in the sand and I can respect you as a human being, but that means that you respect me as well, you know? And I think that was lost for so long because, you know, the whole uh, uh, (laughs) conversation around like gender pronouns and stuff like that is like, well, what does it cost you to just use my pronouns and, and, and show, show me that respect as as a human being It's like, well, what does it cost you to respect that I operate in a world where it's, he and she, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think 
uh, I think that slide has been very interesting to watch. And um, it's kind of fascinating that uh, COVID was kind of the culmination of it all. And they, they felt like they owned the world. And you can see how that manifested because they did. And um, I think they were able to implement a lot of that stuff based off of, yeah, like you said, the the groundwork that uh, had been laid for years and years and years of like conditioning people to, you know, uh, think more. And not that thinking socially is bad, but um, it's just that there are downsides to thinking as a collective rather than chasing sovereignty, chasing independence, chasing freedom, you know? And um, that's kind of... I, we, we've seen the downside to, you know, quasi con- communism in the modern age. Mm-hmm. Oh, we definitely have. And I mean, I think it's interesting that you point out that it's always been a slide to the left. And it's not just on social issues. Like we, we social issues are what we talk a lot about a lot in the culture war, but like we don't really even talk about balancing budgets anymore. Like right. I remember when I was growing up, like people still cared about like, you could only spend, the government could only spend how much the government brought in. That was kind of like something that people cared about. That's out the window. Like, no, no. Tom Kretchen and Paul Martin did. I know. I know. <laughs> Liberals. Liberals yeah. were balancing the budget. Now, now nobody cares about that. Like, uh, no, Republicans aren't talking about that. Conservatives aren't talking about that. Nobody's, I mean, Danielle Smith is talking about that and like pretty much nobody else. Yeah. And, and it's, or, I mean, maybe, just I don't know, I actually don't follow America as closely, but I just, it's everything. It's, it's guns. It's, it's property rights. It's like, like there are more renters in Canada than there've ever been just because people don't own things anymore. Cause you can't because they're pricing well, us. Out of, they're pricing us out of property. The, the average cost of a house in Toronto is like 1.2 million, you know? And who would want to well, live you- there anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another <laughs> story, you know, but <clears throat> I mean, uh, you, you would know, David, what's the median income in Canada? Like 40 like grand, 52, 52,000 Canadian, I think. Right. So yeah, maybe after like, you know, but what, what is that? Uh, what is that, Matt? Like six, 60 uh, years of saving up or something? <laughs> I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, like, here's the thing though, then you pay taxes. So really you're only taking home like 32,000, maybe, maybe 30. Right. And that doesn't include the GST you're paying or the utilities or the property taxes. So really, what are you taking home at the end of the day? Maybe 20 grand. And like maybe if you scrimp and save and like, you know, I'm talking about after like mortgage and all that kind of stuff, right? Maybe you get 20 grand out of that that you have something to do with. And if you scrimp and save 500 a month, you get 6,000 a year. It would take you, how many years would it take you? in order to save up a hundred thousand for it would take you like 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. For a yeah. down, for a down payment. And, <laughs> and who's to say in 20 years that the houses won't have gone up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, they, they almost certainly will have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's almost inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if history is any indication, I mean, when was the last time we saw Houses drop precipitously over the long term, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we're fucked. Uh, <laughs> here we are, you know, <laughs> ringing in the American- <laughs> ringing in the new <laughs> year as, <laughs> as we talk about the ills of the world. <laughs> I think uh, Ukraine is a fascinating story from this year. It's like garnered such polarization of like people who support the current thing, just being like all about Ukraine, all of a sudden, you know, it's like, you know, it's their favorite pet issue, you know, and like, it's just, they, they have nothing but, you know, effusive support and adoration for Ukraine as an entity and all the wonderful things that Ukraine has done in the world and, you know, how important it is for Ukraine to have sovereignty. And then there's the other side that's like, we sent them a hundred billion dollars this year. We you just, know? the the United States, I think, just signed on for 64 billion more. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. <clears throat> you know what's interesting? You know what was interesting about Ukraine, Ukraine to me? And I want to preface this statement with 
the reality that I am not a foreign policy expert and I don't pretend to understand what's going on. Okay. I come, I come at it from a place of ignorance and humility because I don't understand what's going on over there. And, um, I do feel for the people who are affected by it. That sucks. But what was interesting is Ukraine came right on the heels of like COVID kind of withering out, right? And so Ukraine happens. And immediately it was like, you have to support Ukraine. That's what you have to do. If you don't support Ukraine, well, you're you're a Russian sympathizer. If you're a Russian th- sympathizer, you must be a Nazi or like a racist or something. And it was just like, it was that thing right away. And so for me, after COVID, where it was, well, you have to be pro-vaccine. You have to do this. It's for your community. So grandma doesn't die. You have to think this way. This is what you have to do. If you don't do it, then then you're you're an, you're an anti-vaxer. You're 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 going to kill everyone. And after we kind of figured out that that wasn't true, I saw that happen with Ukraine, and I was like, nope, no, I'm just going to sit back and see what happens. And what's fascinating now with these Twitter files is that now. Those of us who have been wearing our tin hats successfully knew that the Hunter Biden laptop was a real thing, okay? We've known that for how long has that story been? Two years, right? Like, this isn't... What's coming yeah. out now isn't a surprise. Three, to, point, yeah. What's, what's happening three. now isn't a surprise to anyone who paid a damn ounce of attention to it, right? Okay? We knew that it was real. We knew that there were misdealings. We knew that there was strange stuff going on. And we knew it was connected to the Biden family. And now the Biden family sits in the White House and Ukraine goes to war and we are funneling billions of dollars through them. And it's like, well, that's interesting. And do I know what's going on? No. But do I know it's bullshit? Yes, I do. Like, you just have to look at it objectively. Mm-hmm. And not to mention uh, that Biden was caught on camera promising to withhold funds to Ukraine if they didn't fire the, you know, the lawyer who was looking into the cor- the corruption with Hunter Biden's connection to Burisma. You he know? bragged about it. <laughs> yeah. And then and then, of course, it's Trump who gets impeached for looking into it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, like, of, of course that's what happened. And, uh, you know, our, our, our good friend, Matt, um, called it pretty early on that, uh, he, he thinks Biden didn't even want to run, <laughs> that he was basically forced to by the, the global elites to, you know, be their little puppet. And to be fair, I mean, that's basically what he's done, you know, I mean, he's, he's like launched into like leftist politics he's hired all sorts of sexual degenerates who have like stolen women's luggage at the airports and like picked up felonies because of it and like tried on their clothes and stuff, you know? And, um, and that's all well and good, you know, but God forbid, you know, you you support Trump who has looked into it. I don't think, you know, (laughs) above reproach, like, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, I tend to take a balanced approach with it, but you know, for sure, like Biden has engaged in all kinds of like global corruption and like, you know, you know, uh, Hunter Biden's deals with 10% going to the big guy, you know, and, uh, Pedro like, Peter. you know, you, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't, you don't get wealthy working on a political salary, you know, yeah. and all these people are wealthy. And, you know, I, I think, frankly, to me, one of the most fascinating stories of 22 is this whole FTX thing and um, the, the the stuff with Sam Bankman Freed, where it's like, oh, OK, so he was like donating 40 million dollars to Democratic candidates um, during the midterm election. And like, oh, shortly a month or two later, it's exposed as a fraud and a Ponzi scheme and all the money's missing. But like oops, now we're going to hold them accountable, you know? And this is the whole, like, fraud of, like, like global communications. It's like, they all know what's going on. They, they know they know the fraud that they were engaged with. And, um, you know, it's just like, like they, don't, they don't care because they're not going to get caught. Everybody's in on it. And then when, um, when somebody like uh, Sam Bankman-Fried finally does, you know, get exposed is like oh, okay yes it was a fraud they don't have any problem throwing him under the bus you know it's like you know cost we'll, of doing we'll, business we'll convict, 
Yeah, exactly. Well, well, we'll convict him now and make a big show of how unjust we are, you know. But we happily accepted his $40 million and not going to return any of that, you know. And, um, you know, that's just how it goes. What Isn't do you it, think? It, Sorry, go it, ahead, David. It feels, it feels weird to be living at what feels like the the end of democracy, right? Where it's like, when I was growing up, and, and like this, is a, I think your question was really interesting, Zach, where you said, has it always been this way or are we, and we're just becoming aware of it or is it getting worse? It's like, I think it is getting worse. Mm-hmm. I think, I think the government is interfering more in our lives. And I think it, it's trying to do that because it's trying to squeeze more out of it for these weird games that they're playing around the globe. Like where, Canada brought in more immigrants, and I don't have a problem with immigrants at all. We brought in more immigrants in the last quarter than we did in the year 2011. Wow. 3.7 million illegal immigrants crossed the border into America yeah. in, the last, in the last year. Yeah, I mean, I, I live in... Texas. That's 1% of the American population. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And... Um, yeah, like I, I live in Texas and it's like, I can attest, it's like, they like, um, they just swarm through and it's like, you know, you'll post like, uh, like, you know, I, I had like, you know, tools for sale on like Facebook marketplace, you know, and I'm just like swamped by all these like Spanish messages and stuff, you know, like, and I was, I'm, cause like, um, uh, they're, they're the people that do like the blue collar work here, essentially, you know? And um, it's like almost every message for like tools is like <laughs> in Spanish. And, but it's true though. And then like, you know, I, uh, you know, it was starting to get tightened up, but it's like, there is no repercussions right now for just swarming through. And it's like, yeah, yeah. Like just, just come over. And it's like, if we catch you, we'll, you know, kind of do something about it, but you know, we're not really going to look too hard, you know? And it's like, even people that are like clearly here illegally, it's like, you know, well, well, what are we going to do? You know? And, uh, it wasn't like that before. No, because people actually respected like, and, and I think, um, the push of globalism and what we've been talking about of like, was it always like this? No, it wasn't because people like it, it, look, look at movies, right? Like, you know, back in the day, especially like if you take America, for example, you know, it was great for like a movie to show patriotic values and like pride and like America and Canada hasn't necessarily had that same history. But, you know, these days it's like, well, you know, um, definitely don't like be like banging the drum for America, you know, it's like, that's not going to play in China, for example, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and in general, it's just bad taste to be, you know, proud of your country and, um, and where you come from. And really we're looking at this more in terms of like global humanity. Right. And, um, you know, the concept of like American exceptionalism is, uh, you know, kind of in, in almost in poor taste, you know, and um, yeah, it's like, it's kind of like people, like, I even look at like, um, you know, like people like from history, like, you know, like Chopin, for instance, you know, was originally from Poland and he, he lived, spent some time in France and he always had like a, a longing and like a love for Poland, you know? And I'm not saying that like love of country is like completely dead, but I think that in general, and I, one thing that I did notice when I moved down to Texas was that, um, People are proud to be Texan and they're proud to be American. And I've come across people in Canada who are like, who, who, who like Canada, even maybe love Canada, but it's, it's hard pressed, frankly, to find people who love Canada, let alone for sure. I've never met anybody who was like proud to be an Ontarian. <laughs> now, I have never met that person in my life. I don't know why. Like, it is actually quite a, a beautiful land and oh, like it is. Yeah. huge amounts of opportunity. Like there's yeah. almost nothing more beautiful than like 
Algonquin Park or Absolutely. the Muskoka's or yeah. the rolling hills of, of the Cambridge area, to be honest. Yeah. Do you yeah. think <clears throat> that's an interesting that's an interesting point? Because I've been in Ontario my whole life. And I'm not proud to be from Ontario. I guess I'm just a product of Ontario for that. Um, and I think, and I think to a certain extent, it's partly because tr- Ontario is so dominated by its its large cities, and no one in Toronto is proud of being from Ontario because they're not proud of anything. So, <laughs> so is it just that like we're so city centric? Like, I wonder if you were to ask someone who has lived. 70 years outside of Timmins, what they feel about living in Ontario. Like what would that person's response be? Because like, so I drove up, I I got in a a truck with um, a couple of friends this year and we drove up to a place called Long Lac to go on a moose hunt. And it was actually really, really, really cool to do because you leave the the GTA and you you point your, your truck north and you watch everything change. You watch the people change. You watch the land change. You watch the type of forestation change. Everything changes. And like the separation between what happens in Long Lac and what happens in Toronto might as well be the separation between what happens in Ontario and what happens in Japan. Like it's they're they're almost two different places. And so I wonder, I wonder if you were to ask, because the people up there that that I ran into we're of a different ilk than the elitist Toronto person, right? They, they were very kind. They were warm. They were accepting. Um, and I mean, I was, I was, I suppose in a bit of a bubble because I was hunting. And so I was constantly running into hunters. Um, but they were proud of what they were doing and they were engaging with Ontario. So I don't, I don't have an answer, but I wonder if you were to ask someone from up there what they thought about living in Ontario, how that would differ from the dude walking down, um, you know. They'd probably st- define themselves as Northern Ontarians. Yeah. You're, yeah. That's a very like, good point. They're like municipalities like, yeah, I've been hunting in Timmins for about 25 years, eh? And, they probably uh, love being from Timmins. They probably oh, love yeah. Timmins. Yeah. They, they would yeah. identify as being from Timmins before Ontario. Yeah, oh, yeah, well, but that's a weird thing. It's like Ontario is the only one. British Columbians love being British Columbian. True. Right? Albertans obviously love Certainly. being Albertan. Yeah. I mean, even the good from people from Saskatchewan love being from Saskatchewan. <laughs> they, yeah. they do. They really do. Yeah. And, and Manitoba as well. Certainly Quebec. Oh, there's Absolutely no question. Quebec. Above all. <laughs> <laughs> Above all Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, the Maritimes, they kind of glum together, you know. <laughs> well, they're proud of their we lobsters. Some, we've had some good guests from PEI. We really have. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, they're, they're, PEI they're has, has outperformed on the Canadian story. Like, we have some great people from Oh, Canada. really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, was, I, I feel like the East... I feel, I feel like the East Coast is so underrated because I've spent a bunch of time oh, on both. I've, I've spent a bunch of time on the West and a bunch of time on the East. And the East is a... It's a quieter charm. The The West Coast is so immediately breathtaking with its landscape and its mountains and the culture of outdoor sports like snowboarding. And, you know, there's there's a very definable and easily understood thing that you can do on the West Coast. And the East Coast isn't that well branded, but some of the best people I've ever run into in Canada have been on the East Coast. They are absolutely so hospitable and cool out there. And their culture is incredible. And they're they're tough, man. The the people who go oh, yeah. out, the people who who go out on the water and who who fish and who work in that industry and all of the weather that they get, like they they get beat up out there. And that does a certain thing to people. And I like I I feel like I'm not saying that the East Coast is better than the West Coast. They're two different things. But what I am saying is absolutely the East Coast is underrated, 100. percent I agree, and it's beautiful too. And uh, yeah, I know what you mean about like having a different charm for sure. Like uh, it's more quaint, you know. They uh, like they're less connected to like the digital world in a way. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. And like the West Coast, you know, like. Like, you know, 
I know like BC has a lot of like sort of hidden gems and stuff like that, like Nelson and Kelowna and stuff like that. But like, you know, there's no like Vancouver equivalent on the East coast, you know, where it's just sort of like a hub of like, you know, of Congress and, and right. art and, and right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I, yeah, I, 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 told, I, I would love to go back there someday. Where did you go? Well, maybe you're going to come on a, on a crazy uh, Alberta tour with me. This, this, uh, we'll see. We'll see. Who knows? Exactly. You know, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, play some music and <laughs> speak to the people. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but we're, uh, I guess we're near our end of our, of our show, unfortunately. It seems to be that way, doesn't it? I, uh, it does. I've, uh, I'm sad to see it end. This is this has been so much fun. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, we can keep going, but I have to go to the bathroom. So. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll let David. We'll let David relieve himself, and and Dan and I will continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Oh, this man's lighting a cigar. Mm-hmm. Oh, I feel so left out, man. I gotta come visit you down there. My heart, like, oh, you I, do, I, I I love Canada. I love Canada with my whole heart unabashedly and wholeheartedly. I am in love with this country. I think it's important to, to stand up for, for what this country should represent, but man, do I love Texas? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you would love it. Like, Oh, oh like you, you are a little Texan, you know? You and I mean, fit, like, right I, I feel like I could be at home there. I feel like I, there's, there's a few places in America that I could be at home. I could be at home in Texas I could be at home in a, the, the one that catches people off guard. Um, I don't know if, I don't know how much traveling around the country you've done, but have you ever been to Idaho? Oh, Idaho is beautiful, man. That place is incredible. You would love Idaho. You would love Montana. Oh, I do love Montana. I've been everywhere yeah. in the lower 48. I've oh, okay. been every, oh, every nice. state in the lower 48. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, but any any one uh, any one of those states where the Great Plains meet the mountains, whew. yes, unbelievable. Oh, it is yeah. just something else. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, I even like yeah, like like you said. I mean, I I Canada will always have such a special place in my heart, and I do miss it because, like, you know, even I mean, part of it's like what you grew up with, right? But I just miss miss like the the lushness of Canada and like. You know, down down in Texas, particularly South Texas, you know, things are more dry. Like, you know, there's less like beautiful lawns and that kind of thing. It's very dusty. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It it, it is more dusty, frankly. Um, (laughs) And uh, I mean, um, one of the most like beautiful sights I've ever seen was like just outside of Calgary and just seeing like the flatlands and just boom, Mountain. there's boxes. Yeah. And it's just like breathtaking, truly. Oh, yeah. it's something special. Yeah. That I, I don't know, David, you would probably know, but there's a highway that you drive like through the mountain ranges. And I I, I believe you're going through Jasper when you're when you're going down this highway. And it's just like giant range on your right giant range on your left and you're just weaving through them and it's just like Uh it it almost it almost doesn't feel like it can be real like when you're driving through something like that like that you're just like how is it how is it that this actually exists it is so magnificent in its magnitude that it's just like i gotta go back there (laughs) <laughs> yeah you, you well get out here buddy get out here we can fly again that's we worked hard on that that's where the hot springs are right yeah uh, down by radium yeah you go well there's the trans canada goes kind of through but then there's also i don't even actually know the name of the highway funnily enough but there is the one that runs from banff to jasper and that's a that's a great one it's uh yeah and uh, do, do you know, uh, it's like Raven's Pass or something like that, where like there was like... Crow's Nest Pass, Crow's Nest Pass. Yeah, yeah. Crow's Nest Pass, where like, what was it, like 50 people died in like a mountain slide or something like that? Yeah, oh, yeah, like uh, it's a huge, and you can see it, you can see that like the the mountain basically collapsed. 
yeah. and just flowed down into the valley. Like, just crushed the valley. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, just like, and, and then people congregate around the, the, the grave site. <laughs> They're enjoying the hot springs. <laughs> yeah, just having a great time ordering snacks. <laughs> it's just weird to think like, how some do you ever go into places? I was just in England and I went to uh the, the Tower of London and I went to in the Tower of London is this chapel and and uh William the Conqueror was the one that in 1040 AD began building uh this building. So it's like almost a thousand years old. And and you, sometimes you stand in it, you're just like, wow, imagine all of the things that happened here. I mean, you were just at the Alamo uh, like a few months ago that you were like going through that kind of experience too yeah. right yeah exactly uh, history's a beautiful thing like it's crazy yeah because like um and just going to the alamo too i think david i've talked to you about this but zach i don't know how much i have but it was just um really eye-opening to me in regards to like how much history matters in shaping culture and it's like you know you know, you, you, you look at, like, our preconceptions about, like, Texas, right? It's, like, gun-toting, can't tell me nothing, right? Um, just going to do my thing, independence, freedom, you know? And then, like, an event like the Alamo, it was 2,000 people telling the Mexicans to go fuck themselves. <laughs> you know? Because they weren't happy with, like, you know, the tax rate right? and Texans were less puritanical than the Mexicans were at the time. So Mexico was trying to like crack down on all these like, you know, uh, you know, policies on the Texans. Right. And the Texans were like, I don't fucking think so, <laughs> you know, and to the point that they were willing to lose their lives, those 2000 men to hold their ground and say, fuck you, Mexico, not on my watch. And then you look at, not to disparage, can't, we're off the record, right? I wasn't aware yeah, we that we know. were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, anyways, uh, I'll just keep going. Because what I'm going to say isn't exactly complimentary to Canada, to be honest. But uh, you know, we, uh, you know, Canadians still don't truly have their independence. You know, it's like. We're still a, a, a colony of Britain, essentially. And the only reason why we gained, quote unquote, sovereignty was by, you know, writing a letter to the queen and begging for her to, you know, make an, an allowance to please just, you know, allow us to have this frozen wasteland. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I, I'm being facetious, of course, because I do love Canada, but um <laughs> It's 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 pretty stark the contrast in the formation of Canada versus Texas is my point. <laughs> yeah, or or even America. Like America fought a war. And Canada was right. like, please. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, we've been good. Canada was like, we've been the good kids for a long time, and we want our reward now. America, like they took off. Like right. we're sitting here beside them, like, whoa. <laughs> It's it's the prodigal son story, you know. Canada is the son who didn't leave, <laughs> <laughs> and what, we never was, had to sleep with the pigs. But you know, <laughs> what was your feeling around the Alamo? Because I I talked about this on my or sorry on our episode with Raquel Dancho about my trip to Vimy Ridge, um, uh-huh. and when I stepped on like that place is absolutely bonkers. Um, and a lot of a lot of people don't know this, but there is a um, there's I don't know how big it is, but there's a an allotment of land that the French government has given to Canada. And so when you step oh. onto that land, there's no borders. But when you step onto that land, when you step onto the site of Vimy Ridge, it is legally Canadian soil because of huh. what Canada did for Europe in that war in taking Vimy Ridge, right? And it, it's that was awarded to Canada uh, as a as a thank you and a sign of respect. And the site is incredibly cool. Um, they left a whole bunch of the land. Um, they, they didn't like they didn't fix a whole bunch of the land. So a lot of it is very manicured, and there's nice lawns and walkways and a big monument, and it's all beautiful. And then surrounding that is shelled land and so there's all these foxholes and the land is just wow. like loaned to bits so that we can remember right 
And mm-hmm. as I like, it was a, fu- it was a funny thing. I went there when I was on a tour and we were driving from one place to another place. And it, w- it, it came up that like, Hey, like we can stop by Vimy Ridge. Like, does, does anyone want to go? We have the time to do so. And I was like, Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Like, yeah, w- we can do that. Um, and it happened super early in the morning just cause, cause of how the drive worked out. So like I was rolling off the bus at like six thirty seven in the morning in like pajamas and like, just like had just rolled out of my bunk and I walk onto this land and I walk through all the monuments and I start reading about what happened and dude, it like, it broke me down. Like I cried like a baby reading about like reading about how Canadians went to a foreign land and gave their lives for something and stood for something. And that was a concept that was always familiar to me because I had learned about it in high school, but like to, to hear those stories in a classroom and then to walk the land that they bled on is two entirely different experiences. And it, that, that experience changed me. Um, so I guess the, the question is like, did you get that, that feeling of, I don't even have good words to describe it, but of sacrifice and humanity and purpose and resolve to do the right thing from the Alamo? Uh, Absolutely. And I think probably to be fair to a degree, I think growing up as a Canadian, I think something that my identity was intrinsically tied towards at that time and from the time that I was a child, you know, something that was like a Vimy Ridge situation might hit me personally slightly differently than the Alamo, just in the sense that I was like observing it rather than like being it. Um, And, but, but at the same time to answer your question is like, absolutely. Like you feel like sure the panic, but also the resolve and the bravery, you know, to be in this church this mission and to be holed up there while you're being shelled by like 10 X, the men on the other side is what you have. And Mm -hmm. to just be like, this is where we draw the line. This is what we hold on to. And actually they have posted outside um, of the Alamo, um, the letter that was sent out from the Alamo that actually rallied Texas um, uh, to its defense. So essentially what happened was like, they, they made their stand at the Alamo they were decimated. All 2000 men essentially lost their lives. But what happened was that because of that event, Texas overall was notified of what was happening and the entire, you know, state uh, rallied together to actually beat back the Mexicans and gain uh, Texas uh, independence. And I want to read you the letter uh, that was sent out um, because it's fascinating. And like just the, the pinnacle of, character and bravery and uh hang on let me just pull it up uh, one quick second uh, mm. I don't know. <clears throat> while you're doing that the the other thing that I, I took away from Vimy Ridge that I that I took away now that I didn't take away on the day is the the difference in historical placement that I have experienced compared to what those people experienced um because no one's asked me to go across an ocean and die for anything and yet yeah. that is something that happened not very long ago. And not long ago at all. And I I don't know what the future holds, but that might be something that's required of people again and perhaps shortly. Things aren't getting better right now. So it's just interesting it's interesting to think about your place in history and and you know, I I wonder what Canada's Alamo is going to be. Yeah, I, I mean, and maybe it was the trucker convoy. Well, maybe that's what actually defines us. I, 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 I yeah, yeah, I, I love the trucker convoy. I'm hesitant to equate the trucker convoy to 2,000 men sacrificing their lives, but uh, it, 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 was, fair, it, was definitely, it was definitely a monumental occurrence. And I, I don't know how you guys feel, but I think like our generation as a whole grew up in such safety and like we had everything 
at the click of a button, you know, not necessarily in our childhood, but now we have things like Uber Eats and like just convenience is left, right, and center. Like it's never been easier to be a human. And I feel like that's fostered just such mediocrity overall in humanity. You know, it's like we used to produce Beethoven's. We used to produce Napoleon's. And I get that those are like once in a generation type. Well, not even once in a generation. Like, you know, they're essentially like top of their class in like world history, more or less. Um, but it is. And sure, like maybe we have like. I don't know who the, who the modern equivalents would be. You know, maybe Elon's going to do some terrific things. But at the same time, I mean, you know, what, 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 what's he truly accomplished? You know, it's like uh, electric cars and, you know, he bought, he bought a platform that was diving too far away from free speech. And, you know, lo- love the guy, but, you know, let's not make a false idol out of him, you know. Um, but in, ter- in terms of, like, artistic competent- competency or, you know, all these things, it's like, do you guys not feel like we live in a generation where, like, you know, slightly above mediocre is, like, you know, celebrated, even worshipped sometimes? We live in a cult of personality, essentially, you know? It's like fame, no matter how it's obtained, is currency. Attention mm-hmm. is currency. Which it is. Yeah. And, and people can garner attention for all kinds of... Uh, crazy things you know it's like uh you look at that like catch me outside girl you know and it's like she's she's a millionaire because because she was a brat that's what gained her millions of dollars you know and it's like you there's i'm sure all kinds of artists just sort of toiling in, in obscurity that <laughs> it's not like we, don't, we have like bad artists but it's just a matter like Part of me feels like there's maybe some somebody who's just like completely obscure at the moment that like is toiling away and like creating great stuff that will be like held in like high esteem 50, 100, 200 years from now that uh, we don't recognize. I looked at like, um, I was doing big in music, right? And like Franz Schubert is, you know, not necessarily regarded as like the best of the best but like you know let's hear below beethoven and bach and and those guys and hardly anybody who knew who he was in his lifetime you know right i guess that that that's gonna be a comfort to all three of us as we strive towards creating our our art in the various ways <laughs> yes. that we do <laughs> yes. we all collectively toil <laughs> <laughs> but but i do I do have the letter from uh, from the Alamo. Yes, yes. Um, give that. Give that, that'll be a good way to close it off because I do have to run here. But uh, I want to yeah. hear this. I want to hear this. Um, so um, it was sent by William Barrett Travis, and he says, um, uh, "Commandancy of the Alamo, Bear, February twenty fourth, eighteen thirty six, to the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged." By a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana, I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand four or five days. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death, William Barrett Travis, and that's how heroes are made. <laughs> yeah, it's also how you stand for something, right? That's, that's the conviction that's required, you know. And we still remember it two hundred years later. Two hundred guys had a lot of conviction. Two thousand. Well, I like that. 
Yeah. Well. Oh, and, and then, sorry, uh, he adds a postscript. P.S. The Lord is on our side. When the enemy appeared in sight, we had not three bushels of corn. We have since found in deserted houses 80 or 90 bushels and got into the walls 20 or 30 head of bees. I'm not sure what a bee is, but... <clears throat> It's a, it's a cool <laughs> workplay anecdote. <laughs> He's like, we have food. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Lord is on our side. <laughs> well, may we all find our conviction. <laughs> the yes. Lord is on our side. That's the key takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan, for uh, sharing your your perspectives on this year and just having a good cousin chat with us. <laughs> Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's The C-A-D Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is.